be. So what is my role in all of this? I'm gonna tell you right now. Here's my role. I can take my jacket off. What? No, I'm gonna take my jacket off right now. Here's my role as we study with Dr. Nehemia Gordon, He's gonna PhD. He's gonna roll up the sleeves. And I wanna know how many people will do this with me. Roll up our sleeves and get down with Nehemia with the information, the inspiration, and the revelation. Welcome to Hebrew Gospel Pearls, episode 27, the beginning of season four. And before we get started, and I know people always get frustrated when I say before we get started. <laughs> Why does Keith want to do before we get started? Because I will not continue without first acknowledging this important thing that's happening right here, right now. We have with us Dr. Nehemia Gordon, PhD from Barlan University. And the last time that you saw us when we were going through season three, we had not gotten a chance to make this announcement. I wanna make this announcement right now. Hebrew Gospel Pearls has Dr. Nehemia Gordon, PhD from Barlan, and Nehemia, I'm humbled and I'm blessed, but I want you to share with our friends something about the process. Why did you do it? What is it? What is this all about? Well, so first I just wanna acknowledge the people that we, we're pre-recording this. So. Uh, they've actually heard about me getting my PhD months ago. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Don't you understand? Some people have heard that. Yeah. We've got a brand new audience. We're all over the world right now. There's some people that don't For know sure. us. Okay. Tell them about this. So, um, you know, I did my master's degree at Hebrew University many years ago and really didn't have any plans to, to um, like, I, you know, I was doing research and putting out podcasts and teachings and didn't have any plans to do a PhD. And uh, uh, I won't go into the whole story, but I ended up giving a lecture um, at the, it was actually your idea. You said, Nehemia, let's go to the International Society of Biblical Literature in Helsinki. So I gave a lecture at this SBL in, yes. in uh, Helsinki in 2018. Mm -hmm. And I had somebody walk up to me afterwards and say, this, this is PhD material, is this part of your dissertation? Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I'm not, I have no intention to do a PhD. Mm -hmm. And one thing led to another. <laughs> And to say the least. It's kind of like in the book of Esther, there's this <laughs> phrase, and he was still speaking. <laughs> and then the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and that's really what happened. It was just this series of events. And I eventually um, started working on, formally, on a PhD dissertation. I'd essentially already written a portion of it. Mm -hmm. I had to go through a whole bunch of longer process. Mm -hmm. My lecture at SBL isn't, isn't a part of a dissertation. It had to be developed. But I ended up writing, and, and my topic, I can actually show people uh, awesome. the, the, my dissertation. This is what it looks like. We could show it here on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, my title is The Writing, Erasure, and Correction of the Tetragrammaton in Medieval Hebrew Bible Manuscripts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is at the Zalman Shamir Department of Bible at bar -Lan University. Professor Yosef Ophir, mm -hmm. the top scholar in the world in current scholarship mm -hmm. on the Masoretic Text, was my PhD uh, supervisor on this. Mm -hmm. And it was through his intervention that I was able to get in to see the Aleppo Codex. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that, but I never said the context in which I did it. <laughs> we were keeping this under wraps. <laughs> yeah, we, for I good really, reason. <laughs> we were keeping it under wraps really for the last, almost at this point, four years, three and a half, four years. And the reason I was doing that is I wanted to just do my work. I just wanted to do my, um, my academic studies without having, and look, I, I'll be honest with you. When I was at Hebrew University, I had people writing emails, calling up and harassing my professors. And my professors would say to me, you know, well, we've got 20 students or, you know, 40 students and only, we only get emails about one of them. <laughs> and, so and even back then you were... Uh, well, there, there were people who were, who were like, David Hammer says he has our master's from Hebrew University. I don't think it's true. Is it true? And, and, and uh, you know, I actually asked one of the professors, did you respond? He's like, why would I respond to some rando from the internet? Right? They, <laughs> they, he, he said to me, uh, if they have that question, they should ask you, right? Or they could look up your thesis in the library catalog Absolutely. and find, like, like that's the best way to do it, in, at least in Israel, is you look up the person's thesis or dissertation in the library catalog. And here I'm going to show you, Keith, in the library catalog of Barlan University. Huh. I'll show it up here on the screen. Um, uh, you can see it has the title, and there it says, Nehemia Gordon, author, 2021. Pretty cool thing is the thesis is actually online. Although currently, 
as we're recording this, you have to log in as a student of the university. Eventually, I think in about a year, I'm not sure what the procedure is exactly, anybody will be able to just go on the website of the university and read my thesis. Mm -hmm. All I think it's 285 pages or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, uh, mostly I wrote it in English. It's, it's interesting, when I wrote my master's thesis, um, wow, 15 years ago at this mm -hmm. point, I wanted to write it in English, and they said, well, this is the Hebrew University. Uh, you should write it in Hebrew. Okay, I wrote it in Hebrew. It took me a little bit longer, but I wrote it in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to do the PhD, they said, we prefer you write it in English because we write it in Hebrew. No, very few people ever read it, and mm -hmm. we want people to read this stuff. Mm -hmm. English is now the international language of scholarship. Uh, but but I'll, I want to get to <laughs> Hebrew gospel pearls, so I'll just quickly um, tell the story of why I did the lecture at SBL in the first place. So we had done the teaching, I had done it many years ago, and we've shared about this many times, about how when they wrote the name yud heh vav -Hey, they accidentally put in the Cholam, what you call the Cholam from heaven, mm -hmm. in your book, uh, whatever it's called, your, your little, little book. Uh, what is that book called? <laughs> We'll put, make you we'll put it up name. on the screen there. Um, his hallowed name revealed again. That's the name of his book. Um, and I talked about that in my book, Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence. Mm -hmm. And we had people say, well, that, these are official manuscripts. These are official uh, manuscripts of, of the Bible. They would never make a mistake. And if they did, you would never find it. Mm -hmm. So I decided to, well, I'd already been working on uh, looking for the full vowels. And I kept finding how they made mistakes with the name. Mm -hmm. And they would do different things to correct it. And I thought, well, this is a great topic for, for an academic conference. What are all the different things they do when they make a mistake with the name? Mm. And I found something like, I don't even remember. Uh, at the time, I think when I gave the lecture, it was like 12 things since that. I found a couple more. Um, so uh, not only do they make mistakes in the um, Hebrew manuscripts in the Middle Ages, in the Aleppo Codex I found, they made, this was, this was the coolest thing, Keith. I did a teaching a few years back called The Mistake That Got It Right. Yes. And the teaching... I, I explained how this scholar uh, who lives today is an old man in Ashdod, Israel. He spent years with um, Professor Israel Yevin examining the Aleppo Codex. Mm -hmm. And he told me that one of the things he remembers is they never, if they made a mistake with the vowels or accents of the Aleppo Codex, they didn't change it because not only were they not allowed to erase the letters, they're not allowed to erase the vowels. And I remember doing the teaching and saying, and, oh, and, he ba and this is now documented in a database, database, um, and I said, I wish I could check that for myself. I said this in the teaching. Well, as part of doing the PhD dissertation, I got to check it for myself. And within about 20 minutes, I found that it was wrong. Not only did they erase the vowels and the accents of the name Yehovah, I found five places where they erased the actual letters of the name Yehovah. That's in my PhD dissertation. Mm -hmm. uh, later, with Professor Ofra, I ended up spending nine hours actually examining the Aleppo Codex itself. Yes. Uh, and that, that was, you know, years ago, I got to see the Aleppo Codex with Reggie White. Mm -hmm. The guy showing it to us was wearing white gloves. I was standing two or three feet away, couldn't we have touch that, it. We have that picture, and we're going to yeah, put that we'll up. Put it's that a up. beautiful picture. But, and I don't have a picture of this next thing, because it was inside a vault, and I wasn't allowed to take photographs, uh, or I'm not allowed to publish the photographs, let's put it that way. <laughs> I actually do have a photograph. <laughs> but, because um, of security reasons, um, maybe years from now, when the location of the codex has been moved that I can share it. Um, but we got to spend nine hours examining the codex with a microscope, ultraviolet infrared uh, at 50x magnification, and we could see things. One of the things I found is other places where it had the vowels Yehovah, and the scribe came along and erased the O. And so there's no question this was a mistake, and I call it the mistake that got it right. It was a mistake that in, that in uh, six instances were not corrected, and other instances was, were, at least one other instance was corrected. So, so um, that's why, that, so that's why yeah. I wanted you to do that. Folks, I, I yeah. um, asked Nehemiah to, to explain this because it's significant to how we're going to proceed with Hebrew Gospel Pearls. Can, can I tell you why this is important for me? Yes. You know, years ago, I thought about doing the PhD, and one of the things I was very disappointed with in the academic world, is I would ask my professors, so how does this help the people? And I remember I had professors who said, this isn't for the people. Mm. And I'm like, so this is just for the six other people who are ever gonna read this journal article, mm. right, on some obscure topic. And I thought, if we're not doing this to get to truth that we can share with people, and look, in some respects, truth is tentative. Mm. All I could tell you in academia and scholarship is what I know right now. Mm -hmm. I might find another manuscript next week. I might find the manuscript that has the vowels Yahweh. 
And it's signed by Moshe ben Amram Hanavi, Moses, the son of Amram, the, the prophet. Mm-hmm. We could find that. It's hypothetically possible. No one's found any manuscript in Hebrew written by Jews that has Yahweh that I'm aware of. Okay. I've looked at thousands. Um, over, in fact, over 10,000. Um, actually, in, in the dissertation, I had to list how many pages that I went through, mm-hmm. uh, pages and fragments and, and columns, and it was something like 90,000 plus. I don't even remember the number. It was, mm-hmm. it was just this massive number. Um, and uh, so why this is important for me is I want to do what I did on my PhD dissertation with the Tanakh manuscripts, I want to do that with the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, and I want to take people along on the journey yes. and not only tell them, guys, here is the truth spoken from the mouth of the PhD. I don't want that. Right. I want to show you, so you see for yourself in the actual sources and the actual manuscripts what you can, what we can find in, in these sources that were preserved by Jews in the Middle Ages of the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. I just gave you the softball. You just hit. It, it took ten minutes for you to get to that, but I wanted you to get to that, and I wanted you all to get to that, because here's the deal. We're gonna take a different approach. In fact, I've even asked Nehemiah to even Mm -hmm. promote it this way. Hebrew Gospel Pearls, study with Dr. Nehemiah Gordon, PhD. So what is my role in all of this? I'm gonna tell you right now. Here's my role. I'm gonna take my jacket off. What? No, I'm gonna take my jacket off right now. Here's my role as we study with Dr. Nehemiah Gordon, PhD. He's gonna roll up the sleeves. And I want to know how many people will do this with me. Roll up our sleeves and get down with Nehemiah with the information, the inspiration, and the revelation that I have had a chance to see him dig into. And you shared it with me, Nehemiah. And what I want to do and what we've agreed we're going to do is we're going to make all of you study partners. My role will to represent you. Each week, by the way, I want to thank Linnell for this. Mm -hmm. Linnell said, hey, people make comments, so each week we can share comments from people. We have those. This is going to be a wonderful process, Mm -hmm. but for me, the reason it's exciting, Nehemiah, is your willingness to Mm -hmm. do what you just said. Mm -hmm. You have always let me into the safe. Sometimes you've let upset you. Why did I let him into the safe? Why did I give him the key? Now we're going to give you all, we're going to give you all the keys. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with Hebrew Gospel Pearls, uh, verse... Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, and one of let's our dear it. friends said, let's read it first in, yes. in a Hebrew and do a, a translation and get started. Right. Matthew 5, 20, here we go. All right. In he, Shem tells Hebrew Matthew, it says, At that time, Yeshua said to his disciples, In truth, I say to you, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If your uh, righteousness does not is not greater than that of the Pharisees and the and the sages, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Keith, there's four major things that we could talk about here. I, I gotta read how- the English first. Let's hear I've got to read oh, it from the English. Oh, oh, is this the Red Letter this Series? Is, this is, no, no, no. This now is how I'm going to give you. Because I thought the Red Letter Series ended in Matthew 5.19. Oh, no, no. You don't understand. <laughs> don't you understand? This is going to be a it's study go past it. process. <laughs> Can you tell people what the Red Letter Series is? I'm going to tell everybody what the Red Letter Series is. Because that's not part of my ministry. No, that's not a part of, of Nehemiah's uh, uh, ministry. Doing. But here's what it is a part of, is mm-hmm. that um, what I ask myself is, how will I get to the fruit of being able to study with you? And the best way to do that is to prepare. So what I did is I went through the entire Sermon on the Mount. I used mm-hmm. the resource that you gave us, which is the pointed text, and we went with a group of study partners all the way through the Sermon on the Mount with the hope and the prayer and the desire that eventually we would get you mm-hmm. to do the same thing. So the Red Letter Series gives people a chance to go ahead and look at the verse, look at the situation, see the, this, but then come to this episode and study with Dr. Nehemiah Gordon. Good news, bad news. It's already done. Bad news for those that aren't interested in being study partners, you won't have access to it. Mm -hmm. Good news for those that are study partners, those that support Nehemiah at Nehemiah's wall and BFA premium people, you'll have access to the entire Mm. Sermon on the Mount in advance. So you will be able to study it like I have. Come to Hebrew Gospel Pearls and study with Dr. Nehemiah Gordon, PhD. That's what the Red Letter Series is about. So, so real read us quickly, the translation that you have there. Yeah, real quick. Here's, this is Howard's translation. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, if your righteousness is not greater than the Pharisees and the sages, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Here's what it says in the NASB. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Go ahead, my friend. So there's four major um, topics here. Uh, there's 
a bunch of my, like smaller topics that I, at this point I'm not sure we'll have time to get to. But, <laughs> yeah. but for major topics, and I don't know that we'll get all of them today either, we have righteousness. Yes. What is righteousness? Mm-hmm. What is righteousness he's talking about? What is the righteousness that Tanakh talks about? What is righteousness for Pharisees? Who are the scribes? Who are the Pharisees? And what does it mean to enter the kingdom of heaven? I'm in. I don't think we're going to get it. We, we keep, I think, every time we touch on the kingdom of heaven, we keep postponing it. Yeah, we'll have because, to do that again. <laughs> because, I mean, it's such an important uh, theme. Yeah. When we get to later chapters of Matthew, there's a whole series of things in the kingdom of heaven. Maybe we'll deal with it there. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have to, we got to talk about this idea of the righteous, being more righteous than the Pharisees yes. and the Sadducees. Yes. Now, I've heard this interpretation of this passage that takes this to mean, uh, and I've heard this from a certain type of messianic, and, and I want to use the term messianic in a very broad sense, mm-hmm. and I want to say from the outset that many of the people that I am describing right now in this terminology as messianic might not may say, well, I'm not messianic. Um, and I'll say, okay, Hebrew roots. Well, I'm not Hebrew roots. I'm not part of that movement. Okay. I'm using it in a very broad sense to refer to anybody. Well, I, I shouldn't say anybody. I'm going to give three different definitions. Um, of three different, what I call messianic type one, two, and three. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this is type one takes this verse and says, uh, not sorry, not type one, type uh, uh, two, um, takes this passage that we just read and says, this proves you have to follow the Pharisees. Mm. And this actually was the inspiration um, years ago when I was interacting with Michael Rood, who's, mm-hmm. we're, we're in his studios. I want to give a shout out to Michael. It's just a you know, I'm so thankful for everything he's done. Michael, Michael, Michael. <laughs> and, I love it. And he came to me with this question. He, he was in Jerusalem, living in Arnona, uh, which is a neighborhood of Jerusalem, overlooking the old city, and really over even looking out of the old city and the Temple Mount. And he had these people who would come to him who were, would dress like ultra-Orthodox Jews. They'd observe the Shabbat like ultra-Orthodox Jews. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about if there's not a string around the city, they can't walk out with their keys in their pocket kind of thing. I grew up like that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's modern day Phariseeism. And I don't mean Phariseeism in a bad way. I mean, Pharisees were really mean something like the holy ones. Mm-hmm. I mean, la hafrish is to separate. To se- yes. And so pushim are those who are separated. What are they separated from? They're separated from the uncleanness of the multitudes, of the am ha'aretz, the people of the land. Mm-hmm. What is the uncleanness of the people of the land? So the Pharisees had this idea while the temple stood. It's no longer today, but they had an idea while the temple stood that um, you must eat your... And we won't have time to go over all this today. When we get to Matthew 15, we'll talk about this in a lot more detail. Um, you eat your non-sacrificial meat in a state of ritual purity. Mm. Now, why would you do that? In the Torah, the only time I need to be in a state of ritual purity is if I'm eating the sacrifices of the temple. Mm-hmm. So the Pharisees said, we want to go above and beyond. Mm-hmm. We want to put a fence around the Torah. And here it's a fence around a fence around a fence. That's the term they use, a fence around the Torah. Right? And the image there is if the Torah is this burning fire and, and I touch it, I get burned by violating the Torah, I'll put a fence, right? And, and let's use the, I don't know, I'll use the analogy. I'm on a diet, right? I'm trying to lose weight here. Mm-hmm. And there's this big mountain of donuts, right? <laughs> and if I have access to those donuts, there's a good chance I'm going to eat it. I'm not actually a donut guy. I'm a cookie guy. Um, it's a big mountain of chocolate chip cookies. And, and there's actually peanut butter there as well. So what I can do is I put a fence around the, the table. I can't even get to the table, mm-hmm. right? Well, there's no way I'm going to eat the cookies, if I, unless I climb the fence, I suppose. But it... it Slows me down. So the, the idea of the Pharisees, the, one of their fundamental concepts is put a fence around the Torah. Mm-hmm. And there's putting a fence around the Torah keeps you from even getting to those cookies, mm-hmm. right? So if, um, uh, you know, if pork, is forbid, pork is forbidden in the Torah, well, I don't even sit down at a table where somebody's eating pork, mm-hmm. right? If there's a Gentile at the table, I could say, well, I'll eat my food and he'll eat his food, but I might accidentally eat his food. Mm-hmm. So that's a fence around the Torah. That's, that's what the Pharisees did. And one of the things they did is they, this fence around the Torah was to say, not only will we observe this in the case of sacrificial meat, we'll do it for non-sacrificial meat as well. Like you're having a hamburger at your house, we have to be in a state of ritual purity to eat that. That's why they were washing the hands. Like I said, we'll get to this when we get to Matthew 15. Um, if we live Wait, that long. Wait, just a second. <laughs> Did you just, just a second, I have to stop for a second. Did you say when we get to Matthew, I'm, I'm making a commitment God right now, willing. we're going to get through the Sermon on the Mount. Is it possible we'll go beyond that? If God allows us to live long enough, yes. Wow, amen. So, um, so, so what is, so, so, so this idea, so the modern day Pharisees years ago, um, meaning they're no longer called Pharisees because this issue of sacrificial meat and non-sacrificial meat mm-hmm. ceased to be an issue when the temple was destroyed. They no longer observe that. Mostly, there were pockets throughout the Middle Ages who did, but mostly it was no longer observed. 
So these people would, Michael would interact with them, and they would, you'd look at them, and you'd think they're an ultra-Orthodox Jew, a modern-day Pharisee. And, you, they, and they were believers in Yeshua. You'd say, what's going on? You know, when you lived in Florida, you, you, you were going to the Messianic uh, synagogue, and you used to go to a, you know, um, a evangelical church. What are you doing? <laughs> Why do you look like an Orthodox mm -hmm. Jew, and you still believe in Yeshua? And their response to him was Matthew 23, which I've written a book about, the Hebrew Shua versus the Greek Jesus. Hopefully we'll get to that one day uh, in the series. But also this verse. And they'd say, see, Yeshua says, be even more righteous than the Pharisees, meaning mm -hmm. be a Pharisee and be a super Pharisee. Mm -hmm. Now, is that what he meant? That's actually number I, one. I want to talk about Messianics type one, two, and three. Yes. Okay. So type one is what you find in... Um, I won't even name names. Uh, th th what they do is they emulate certain aspects of rabbinical Judaism, in particular Reform Judaism, in order to create like a comfortable context mm -hmm. for, Jew for Jews to come to believe in Jesus. And their main objective, they'll tell you, is, is to convert Jews. Mm -hmm. Type two is they emulate rabbinical Judaism, and they say, we want to live as Yeshua lived. Yeshua was a Pharisee. He said, not only should you follow what the Pharisees do, you should follow what they say, even when they don't do it. And you should be even more righteous than pointing to Matthew 5.20. And they try to live in accordance with his teaching. Their main objective, as far as I can tell, is you know they want to convert Jews, just like maybe everybody with the Great Commission and Matthew does. Um, but their main objective is not to convert Jews. It's to live as Yeshua lived. Type 3, they live in accordance with the Tanakh and the New Testament, largely independent of rabbinical Judaism. What do I mean largely? They don't even realize always that they're following rabbinical Judaism. They think they're following the Tanakh. Mm -hmm. and they don't realize sometimes they're following rabbinical Judaism. Uh, but their objective is to, okay, Jesus was a Jew. Let's live as a Jew, Jews do in accordance with the Tanakh mm -hmm. and um, not necessarily obey what the Pharisees say. So that's three different types of Messianics that I've, and I'm using that term very broadly. Again, mm -hmm. some of the people who, who might not um, define themselves as Messianic, I'm including there. So group number two are the ones who use Matthew 5.20 to try to convince people to follow the oral law. Mm -hmm. And that's out there today. You can go online. I would say that's, probably the predominant view within the Hebrew Roots movement. Mm -hmm. um, within, the, within the type 2 slash 3, that's probably the predominant view as far as I can tell. Um, now, if it, you accept this interpretation, it means you must obey the Pharisee laws even more than the Pharisees do in order to get into the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been told by reliable sources that according to the New Testament, you can't earn your salvation. And maybe that's beyond the scope of this um, discussion. Um, cause I hope that, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, but it sounds to me awfully like that. But, so I want to offer an alternative explanation. Let, let's acknowledge that they could be right about Matthew 5.20. Mm -hmm. That is a possible interpretation of Matthew 5.20. Um, I want to acknowledge they could be right, and I want to offer an alternative explanation of what it means to be more righteous than the Pharisees. But since you made me talk about my PhD for 20 minutes, I feel like we have to save that for the plus section. <laughs> Can we do that? It was 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but I want to say something, Nehemiah, um, that has happened is that mm -hmm. on, in the study process, one of the things that happened is we did a lot of work in terms of looking at words. I want to do mm -hmm. one before our, our public folks right now, just one. Um, can you ask the question, if I asked you right now, someone said, I want to do a Bible study on the word Pharisee. What's mm -hmm. the first thing you would do? What would you do to get find out about that? Would you open the Tanakh and find Pharisee in Deuteronomy chapter five or or in? in, in well, I, I would definitely try. You'd try. What right. would you find? I want you to Let, tap let's tap. Let's do for it us. right now, live. And I want while he's doing this, you all. This is an example of what mm -hmm. I think is the power of study with my friend Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. Is the resources that you have access yeah. to, and you type so fast. <laughs> so the first thing, obviously, is you're not going to find the word Pharisee. Well, you say obviously. There's the, a lot of people listening so, that don't. Right. Want, can you explain? So what that? is the Tanakh? Right. Yes. I've got a PhD now in biblical study. What's the Tanakh? So, uh, and I guess it depends who you ask, right? If you right. ask my academic colleagues um, at most universities, maybe not by Allah, but at most universities, they'll say, well, the Tanakh is a library of books that the earliest of which was maybe written down around the year, you know, 700 or 600 BC. Mm -hmm. But if you believe that Moses wrote the Torah, which I do, then you'd say the Torah was written around 1450 BC, let's say give or take 100 years, right? Who mm -hmm. knows? Um, and then the last book in the Tanakh, as far as we can tell, would be based on internal evidence, I would, I would say, is Chronicles, which is around 350 BC. Nice. Secular scholars would say it's Daniel, which has parts from 168 BC mm -hmm. or 166 BC. That's if you don't believe Daniel's a true prophet and written by Daniel, um, but I do. So around, so let's say it's written between roughly 1500 and 400 BC. Mm -hmm. Well, Phariseeism as a movement doesn't only first appears in history around 150 or 200 BC. Mm -hmm. 
So really around, around 200 so BC. So you're telling me they missed the book? They missed the Tanakh, yeah. Okay. They missed, or yeah, they missed okay. the Tanakh, or the Excellent. series of books, right? Okay. And, and that for me was this big shocker. I grew up as a modern day Pharisee, and I was taught that um, when uh, Isaac, or sorry, when Jacob went off to uh, Padan Aram, uh, fleeing from Esau, first he stopped at the yeshiva of Shem and Ever and studied the Talmud. <laughs> and you're laughing. No, I'm just but saying. But I was I mean... told this as a fact. And, and I, on some level, I think I believed this fact until I sat down and read, the, I was skeptical to be honest with you. But, I, but it was, it was Im, implicitly, it was truth. Hmm. Uh, that's why I said the truth is tentative. Actually, the truth is absolute, mm-hmm. but what we know of the truth is tentative, right? Yes. <laughs> um, and I thought that was true at the moment, and then I studied the Tanakh, and I was shocked. One of the things that shocked me more than anything was the story of Shimi. And I don't have time to tell it right now, but Shimi is one of my favorite characters in the Tanakh. And I was told he was, he was da- King David's Rebbe. He sat with King David, and he studied the Talmud, I was taught. And I read the entire books of First and Second Samuel in Hebrew, just one book, the book of Shmuel, and I didn't find any reference to rabbis, Talmud. And then I got really dangerous. I got this book called a Concordance. Right, before computers, it was Conco- uh, Mandelkorn's Concordancia, written in the early 20th century, or compiled in the early 20th century. And I looked up the word rabbi, and I couldn't find it anywhere in the Tanakh. And that, to me, uh, sh- it shattered my world. Mm. I was told... This, I mean, look, it, it, there's an analogy here. I was told that this was the world in which the Tanakh was created, the world of rabbis and Talmud and oral law. And I read the Tanakh, I didn't find a single reference the entire Tanakh to the oral law. And, and maybe the analogy here is for the Christian who looks in the New Testament and doesn't find Christmas, doesn't find Easter, doesn't find a Pope, or doesn't find a lot of the things that are, are the core characteristics of what, let's say, most people in the world, maybe not certain Christians, but most people would define as Christianity. You don't see those in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. So now, to answer your question, I won't find the word Pharisee because Phariseeism didn't exist until after the Tanakh was comp- written, the last book was written. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe you could say that Malachi is the last book. We're still talking uh, before Alexander the Great, mm-hmm. so roughly 350 BC. But I can find the word parash, mm-hmm. which means to separate. Yes or to put aside. Mm-hmm. Leviticus 24, 12, and he was placed in custody. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, actually, it means something else here. Um, he was placed in custody until the decision of Yehovah made, should be made clear to them. And to be made clear there is lifrosh. Now, in the New Testament, you have this concept to rightly divide the word. Mm-hmm. That's a Hebrewism. To divide the word is to interpret. Mm-hmm. Right? It wasn't interpreted or explained what should be done. Now, why does it mean that? Mm-hmm. Because when you read a verse, I can read it in different ways. Mm-hmm. And, if I, and the way I read it is in itself an interpretation, mm-hmm. right? I mean, just take an example, Exodus uh, uh, 34, verse 6. Mm-hmm. It says, Vayomer Yehovah, Yehovah el rechum v'chanun el chapayim v'rab chesed v'emet. And he said, Yehovah, Yehovah. Uh, here, let's pull it up so make sure I'm not misquoting it. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the things I was taught as a child. Always read it directly from the text. Don't ever... Do it. Uh, it's the exact opposite of what some Christians say. You should memorize certain passages. And I did. I misquoted it here. Mm-hmm. Right? Nachim is a lawyer. He knows what it says. No, I, I, I make mistakes <laughs> all the time, guys. And that's why I just went to look it up. So it says, Yavo Yehovah al Panav, Vaikra, Yehovah Yehovah el Rechum Machadun el Chapayim Vav Chesed Vemet. So it actually says, and Yehovah passed over his face and he called, not and he said. I, I, mis, uh, I misquoted it. Good thing I looked it up. So I could read this in two different ways. I could we read Vaikra Yehovah, Yehovah el Rachum v'chanun el Chapayim v'av Chesed v'met, and Yehovah called out. Yehovah is a God who's merciful and gracious. Or I can read it Vaikra, and He called out Yehovah, Yehovah el Rachum v'chanun. And by the way, what is Yehovah, Yehovah? Mm. In Hebrew, that's what's called a nominal sentence. It means Yehovah is Yehovah. Amen. So, um, which is a whole teaching we could do. We're not going to do it now, but. Dividing the word, literally dividing the sentence, changes the meaning. And hence, le faresh is to interpret. So you would think Pharisee means interpreters, but it's what's called, a, um, or it's de- derived from a passive participle. Mm-hmm. Parush is one who is separated, mm-hmm. right? If it was mifarshim, if that was the name of the group, the mifarshim instead of the parushim, it would mean those who, um, 
those who uh, interpret, but it's not. It's pushim, those who are separated. Mm-hmm. So if I look up this word in the Tanakh, I find lefaresh in the sense of to interpret, to explain, and it comes from the meaning of to to divide, to separate. Mm-hmm. In uh, later Hebrew, we find this as a very common meaning where we have this term lahafrish truma, to separate out the truma. Truma is the gift given to the priest. Mm-hmm. And pushim are the ones who are separated from the uncleanliness of the people. So if I don't have it in the Tanakh, I then look to post-biblical Hebrew, post-Tanakh Hebrew, and I see you've got well, the book there. Well, this is going to be great, because I know you do <laughs> want to go to the plus, but I want people to know part of what's going to happen. So I received this book a week ago. Okay. This book is, uh, we, we talk about it, we talk about uh, Marcus Jastrow. Yeah. Jastrow. Now, Hemia, I'm going to have you explain what this book is, but I'll tell you where I got it. Yeah. I got it from a modern-day Pharisee. Okay. I called the modern-day Pharisee, and I said, hey, listen, I'm studying with Nehemiah, and he said to me, did you know Nehemiah got his PhD? This is modern-day Pharisee told this week. True story. Someone that I know? Or? So, and then this modern-day Pharisee said to me, I'm going to actually see Nehemiah at the, uh, you, were, you did a presentation. Oh, I know who you're talking about. Okay, yeah. Not yeah. long ago. Yeah, yeah. And I said to him, I said, well, listen, you know, we're doing this study, and he and I were doing some study on some other things. He yeah. said, well, I'd like to send you a gift. I think okay. this would be very helpful. Oh. So he sent this as a gift. Nehemiah, wow. tell people the significance. Now, that's modern-day Pharisee is Dr. David Moster, he's yeah. a rabbi, Dr. David Moster, PhD yeah. from Bar-Alan, yeah. and he has gotten very excited about what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Here's the great reveal. Yeah. I was so upset when you said that you found other people to study with before you studied with me. In the previous season, Nehemiah <laughs> told us this right, right at the set. I said, I've got to find somebody I can study with. So I found a modern-day Pharisee, <laughs> Dr. Moster, okay. who will every once in a while, as we roll our sleeves up, yeah. come and bring this kind of thing. Nehemiah, can you tell mm-hmm. people the significance of this? So what Jastro did, and, and it's really interesting as I look at the cover, uh, the, the he- modern Hebrew word for dictionary is milon. This is such an old book. It predates the modern word for dictionary, or at least it wasn't the agreed upon word. And he has it as Sefer Milim, mm-hmm. the book of words, as opposed to Milon, which mm-hmm. also means you know, dictionary. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, he, what Jastro did is he combed through rabbinical literature mm-hmm. and he documented the usage of every word he could find. Mm-hmm. Now, now, this is an important point. This is really important. People think, we were taught this in school and it was wrong, we were taught that dictionaries give you the meaning of a word mm-hmm. and they legislate the meaning of a word. So if you use a word contrary to how the dictionary uses it, you're misusing it. Mm-hmm. That's actually not how language works. Mm-hmm. Dictionaries are descriptive, not prescriptive. Prescriptive means they prescribe. They tell you what the word means. Mm-hmm. And if you don't use it that way, you've used it wrong. In reality, the way living languages work is they use words in certain ways and the dictionary describes that. So dictionaries are, are really descriptive, even modern dictionaries. Mm-hmm. And that's why every year you have new words that are added to the dictionary. Mm-hmm. I remember when I was a kid, uh, we didn't have the word to Google something, mm-hmm. right? That was a word. <laughs> I, I remember that actually came into being as, an, as, right. a, as a verb to Google, right? right? Um, so we have these new words that are created all the time, and then the dictionary describes them. So what he did is he went through all of rabbinical literature that you could find at the time. It's amazing. I mean, it's a monumental work, and he documented with each and every word how it was used. Now, he's not always right. Mm-hmm. He could be describing it wrong, but he's describing it to the best of his ability. This is what we're going to do in the plus uh, episode. We're going to be able to go into this yeah. information outside of the Tanakh. Nehemiah, we're going to look at the words. We're going to do something I'm hoping. We're going to squeeze down. Here's my goal. At mm-hmm. the end of the Summer of the Mount, I want to get you, I want you to be sweating out of your jacket. I want, okay. you to have, I want folks to join us and, and roll up your sleeves with us mm-hmm. as we go forward. Now, I have a gift. One last yeah. gift before we switch to the before plus. Before that, can I just say one last thing yes, about Jastro? absolutely. So the reason Jastro is so important for our study of Hebrew Matthew yes. is that um, if we take, if we accept that Hebrew Matthew was written in the first century, or even if you believe it was written in the 14th century, translated from the Greek or Old Latin or something, it is closer to the language described in that dictionary mm. than it is to the language of the Tanakh. Amen. Because the language developed in the Second Temple period to the point where you read some of the later Dead Sea Scrolls and you're like, this isn't the Hebrew of mm-hmm. Isaiah. Mm-hmm. This isn't so much so that we have copies of Isaiah where they changed words, mm-hmm. right? They're coming to the word famously in 1Q Isaiah A, and, and the scribe says, no one knows what this word means. Mm-hmm. So he puts in a later Hebrew word yes. so that people will understand Isaiah, or he's mm-hmm. updating the language. So that's why Jastro is so important for what we're doing. 
Well, we're going to continue on. We're going to be going mm -hmm. to the plus. Now, folks, this is how this works. Uh, this is the odd number. Mm. So the odd number of people become premium members at, at uh, uh, BFA And you can remember that because Keith is odd. I'm odd. And then the even number <laughs> is at Nehemiah's wall. Uh, folks that don't understand how this works, mm -hmm. Nehemiah, I'm going to take 30 seconds for you to explain to them. Mm -hmm. 30 seconds, why would you want people to become yeah. uh, supporters of Nehemiah's wall, being uh, trumpeters on the wall? Yeah, so... Um, you know, I couldn't do what I'm doing. I had a guy write to me just today. He says, where do you have the time to do all the research you do? It's because you made that donation that I have the time to do Amen. all the research you Amen. do. Amen. It's because uh, you made that donation that I have the time and the resources to travel and go see the Aleppo Codex, to travel and go examine the Leningrad Codex, yes. to travel and photograph at Oxford University and Cambridge University, these manuscripts of Hebrew Matthew. Mm -hmm. And it's because of that, I have the time and resources to do this program, to pay for editors, yes. to pay for producers, mm -hmm. and to pay for all the, the expenses and, and time that goes into it. Yes. And I couldn't do this without you. And the Plus episode, it, somebody asked me, how do I just subscribe to the Plus? On my website, you can't subscribe to the right, Plus. Right. It's a gift we give to supporters. Yep. If you support my ministry, McCore Hebrew Foundation, we give you access as a way of saying thank you. Yes, and at BFA International, what we do is we, we're asking you to become study partners with us, not only for this, for everything else we do. And the way that you do that is you become a premium member at BFA International. Look right there, those at bfainternational.com. Become a premium member. Now, let me tell you something we're going to do as a mm -hmm. gift. We did. I am so excited about what Nehemiah has provided over the previous 52 episodes. Mm -hmm. BFA made a big investment. You didn't even hear about this. I'm going to make this. We may have to edit this out. No, so don't edit this what's out. What's going on here? Right now, what I want you to do is I want you, if you've got your mobile phone, I want you to go, whether Android or Apple, go to the Apple store or go to the Android store, and you're going to see a free app. And it's featured on the top, Hebrew Gospel Pearls, our free episodes to the public for all our folks around the world, Nehemiah, that only mm. use their phones. Mm. We now have this series, the, the mm -hmm. public episodes available on an app, BFA Flicks or Biblical Foundations wow. Academy. It's there. It's a gift and it's a thank you to you. You mm. kept raising the bar, Nehemiah, and we thought we better raise the bar too to make it available mm -hmm. to everyone that we can. Folks, that's what we're asking you to do. Uh, become a premium member at BFA, and even if you can't, you can go to the app and get the free information. Nehemiah, anything else before we pray at the end of this? And I want to thank you again for taking mm. the 10 minutes. It was well worth it to mm -hmm. hear your journey as uh, Dr. Gordon, and that's how we're going to mm -hmm. treat you. Anything you'd like to say before we pray? I'm just excited about getting to you know, the whole Amen. issue of... Uh, that we're going to get to in the, in the plus section. I'm, I'm, I can't wait to get to that. <laughs> Pray for us. All right. Father, thank you so much for being with me on this journey mm -hmm. and uh, making me succeed on this way. I, I couldn't have done this. I didn't do this through my might. I didn't do this through my intelligence. I did this through your mercy, your grace, your love, guiding me on the way, mm -hmm. ca keeping my feet on that path day and night, mm -hmm. giving me the energy, the the uh, perseverance, the tenacity. I want you to give that, Father. Mm -hmm. I ask to everyone who seeks you that you put in their heart this ability to hunt down your word and mm -hmm. hunt down your truth. Mm -hmm. Amen. And Father, thank you so much to have for vision and provision, mm -hmm. the vision of even meeting, meeting Nehemiah way back so many years ago. And even as I first interacted with him, I just thought, boy, the world needs to know who he is and who you are through him and what you've allowed him to do. Thank you that I get a chance to, in a small way, uh, to be with him on this journey. Thank you so much for all of the people, all of the people who put their hands to the plow for Hebrew Gospel Pearls. You know who you are. We thank Yehovah for you. We thank you for the provision and the resources. We thank you for our study partners mm. and even for all of the people around the world who will get a chance to access this information freely without having to do anything. Just simply be able to see this information, inspiration and revelation. We ask your blessing, your protection, your power and your peace as we go forward in this project. In your name, amen. Amen. <laughs>